BBC World Service. And now India, a people partitioned. Fifty years ago, when the subcontinent was divided, it was women who suffered most in the violence that resulted. In this third programme in our five-part series, the people who lived through that ordeal tell their stories to Andrew Whitehead. My name is Samrita Pritam. I wrote the poem, Aj Akhaan Varish And I feel satisfied that it is being sung both sides of Punjab, even today. The poem depicts the pain endured by the women of Punjab at the time of India's partition. It's an appeal to an ancient poet to return and witness the fate of Punjab's women folk. Written by a poet herself making her way as a refugee across North India in the autumn of 1947. I was so sad, lost everything, and uh, while traveling in the train, all around there was darkness. Then I could remember only Varsha. He's our beloved poet. So I addressed him. See how your Punjab is ruined. You met only one girl here and wrote a long saga, beautiful saga of her pain, suffering. Now the legs of the daughters of Punjab are weeping. And then I, I had no paper proper, just a little bit paper in my purse because I was traveling. I'm sorry. It is so painful to remember. A human being is still, I think, uh, not matured enough. No inner evolution is there. They are just like animals. If they find uh, opportunity, why to attack women? Why to rape them? Isn't it the insult of their own bodies, but they not uh, realize it? I think it is terrible and horrible. It's not only the partition is horrible, the Women of both sides suffered so much. It is something beyond anybody's conception. We talk a lot about partition, 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 lost all the property, this, that, that. Nobody talk about the plight of the women. Sheila Sengupta worked for several years trying to reunite women kidnapped during the partition turmoil with their families. It's the least acknowledged aspect of partition, the rape and abduction of tens of thousands of women, as different communities, but basically Muslims on one side and Hindus and Sikhs on the other, waged what in areas such as Punjab amounted to little short of civil war. The dismembering of British India and the creation of the mainly Muslim state of Pakistan broke down the centuries-old bonds which had bound these communities together. Each sought revenge, says the Pakistani feminist Nigat Said Khan, by dishonouring the other's women folk. In Islam, in Hinduism and in Sikhism, the, the notion of woman, of being sort of the identity of the community, the notion of honour, which I would imagine probably is more in Punjab, but it would be in, in all three communities across Punjab. And so certainly there's a, there's a lot of um, what we might call crimes of honour in, in the Punjab, where you want to dishonour the other community, you really, really want to put them down, you attack their women. And when you attack them sexually, you're sort of attacking a future generation too. This whole thing of, of raping or impregnating is that you're sort of defiling the progeny. You're sort of almost limiting the race. You're, you're making the race impure. There was a kind of increasing targeting of women as bearers of uh, religious identity. And I think the scale and on which this kind of abduction and rape took place during partition, that, of course, has never been seen before. See, the figures that we have, and nobody knows really how accurate they were, because these are figures of cases that were reported. Uh, they talk about some 50,000 women 
who were raped and abducted on one side of the border, 25 to 30,000 on the other side of the border. They don't actually include figures for Kashmir. And uh, the women who were actually rescued, there were some, a total of say, I think 12 or 16,000 out of the whole lot who were rescued. And apparently these were not the women who had been reported missing. So one, no one really knows how many women actually disappeared at the time. Urvashi Butalia runs a feminist publishing house in Delhi. There's a personal impulse underlying her research on Punjab during partition. She's herself a Punjabi from a family divided ever since 1947. She says the most dangerous moment for women was not when they were besieged in their villages, but when they embarked on the perilous journey to what they believed would be a safer place. When people started to move, either on foot or by train or by buses and so on, uh, women were abducted. Say, for example, if there was a big column of people moving, these were known as kafilas. Very often women would get left behind, they would be looking after the children, they could not move as fast, and they would be abducted from the edges of these big columns of people that were moving at the time. They would be pulled off trains. There was a big um, train massacre at a place called Jassal, I think it was, where it said that 500 women were picked up from the train and they just disappeared. All communities harboured rapists. Women of all religions and social classes were among the victims. B.L. Dutt, a Hindu, crossed over from what had become the Pakistani city of Lahore to Amritsar on the Indian side of the new international border. Once there, he remembers seeing Muslim women heading in the opposite direction, being abducted and assaulted. I have seen with my own eyes Hindus and Sikhs, I tell you, were stretching from the caravan, beautiful woman, I tell you, and they were maltreated. I didn't participate, but I saw with my own eyes, I tell you. Some good Muslim women were delivered and all that. Some of them, they married them. Some of them sold them. Young girls, I tell you. Some of these girls were killed. Others were passed around from man to man until they had little option but to work as prostitutes. As trainloads of refugees from Punjab arrived at Old Delhi station, Korshed Mehta and other medical welfare workers had to fend off the brothel keepers and try to persuade women to come for the treatment many desperately needed. Some were saved, old ladies were saved, and some old ladies were also raped. And I have heard them own, in front of my children I was raped. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? They would tell me. Oof. There were so many women who came from Punjab. Many. Was it just a few who had been raped or was it a lot? Quite a good number. Almost 50 percent. 50 percent. Young girls were not spared at all. Young girls were very brutally raped. Actually, their vagina were torn. Very bad. Very bad. Oh, God. These women who had very bad uh, vagina trouble, you know, what they used to do? They used to put cotton with a termite. And, oh, God, <laughs> when I had to take the cotton out, I would just close my eyes. Oh, and I would close my nose. And then I would, oh, I said, I can't bear it. Blood. No. And young girls, their life was completely finished. Poor things. They, they, they said, you know, what are we to do? Where do we go? The Indian authorities did what they could for them. Urvashi Butalia says centres were set up not simply for rape victims, but also for abducted women who'd returned home and for women widowed and girls orphaned in the violence. Several of them were then housed in ashrams, in, uh, in homes in different parts of India, in Jalandhar, in Amritsar, in Delhi, in uh, Hoshiarpur, and in Karnal, there was a big place in Karnal. The government then really paid for them, looked after them, until such time as they died. And some left the ashrams if they were able to stand on their own feet, but most of them just uh, stayed in the ashrams all their lives. The sewing room in the Gandhi Vanita ashram, or sanctuary, in Jalanda in Indian Punjab. The women are making sheets, mosquito nets and kit bags for the Punjab police. It's well run, and the supervisor has every reason to take pride in her institution. 
even if some of the inmates have been there an unconscionably long time. The women who were originally here came uh, were destitutes uh, um, resulting out of partition, uh, the women and their children. But there are people living here still who were here when almost when this ashram started. Three families, yeah. That's but partition ke time. Ke. Three families are still here who came here in, in the partition days. That's right. oh. They've been here for uh, 50 years. 100. It's a long time, isn't it? Uh. The, the women who, uh, the few remaining women who came here um, after partition um, uh, want to remain here. They say that they, they, they don't want to go anywhere else. In fact, the, uh, the old lady says she, only her dead body will leave this place. We didn't have to cajole the older residents into talking to us of their ordeals. They came and sought us out and told us to sit and listen. I'm telling my story as quickly as I can, said Parakashvanti, but I've waited 50 years to tell it, so please be patient. She's a Hindu, born and brought up in what became Pakistan. She, her husband and young son, along with hundreds of other non-Muslims, took refuge in a local rice mill. But looters attacked took away all their possessions, and then took out her husband, searched him, and discovered their hidden money and jewellery. When her husband returned, he told her that the attackers, having taken as much booty as they could, were turning their eyes on the women. <laughs> He said to me, they are going to dishonor you. They've already started taking away young girls. It would be better if they killed you. If you agree, he said, I'll kill you myself. I lay down with my son. Before I knew what was happening, he hit me with a big sword. Look here, here, on my jaw. I've still got the wound. And here. And he hit me here. It was my husband who hit me. My son was also hit twice. I didn't know what was happening. I was in terrible pain. I felt as if a mountain was being thrown on top of me. When I woke up, some men were standing around me, Muslims. Afterwards, a Sikh boy put some water in my mouth. He said, here, sister, drink, drink some water. But my mouth was full of blood. And then it was night, and two girls helped to hide me. The looters had killed my husband and my little boy. In the middle of the night, about four in the morning, I think, I crept back and saw their bodies. My son's body had already started bloating. Parkashvanti made it over to Amritsa. She was pregnant and gave birth to a daughter. She's lived in various ashrams ever since. She seems never to have come to terms with the fact that the wound which still disfigures her jaw had been inflicted by her own husband. Swaran was brought into the Gandhi Vanita ashram as a baby or perhaps a toddler. Like so much else about her early life, she's not sure. You were six months old when you came here. Well, she doesn't know. There are two registers in the, in the ashram. One says five or six months, the other register says two years. And she has no idea. Where were her mother and father? She doesn't know where her parents are. Where is she from? She believes they died in Pakistan, but uh, she says the government brought her here directly. Uh, she was brought right here. Sad to reflect, Swaran doesn't know who her parents were, where they came from, what community she was born into, or the circumstances in which she was conceived. She's an orphan of the partition storm. Some of the older women in the ashram were abducted at the time of partition and then rescued, or at least that's the word the authorities choose to use. Both governments, and particularly the Indians, put enormous effort into tracing and retrieving women taken by the other side. The historian and feminist Urvashi Butalia showed me an outsized volume published by the Indian authorities five years after partition, listing 29,000 women who disappeared. What it is is that it lists, uh, it gives a district by district list of um, women who were abducted and it gives you a number, it gives you the name of the person, it gives you the place where they thought the person was abducted. 
And it really is tremendously detailed. I mean, it, it gives, in many cases, the name and precise village of the abductor. In no case at all that I can see just flicking through, mm -hmm. does it say... Uh, Abduction. Whereabouts of person or particulars of abductor not known? Yes, it doesn't say that. It always gives you some name um, and uh, quite a lot of description. You know? For example, here they have a 14-year-old girl and they've given uh, the name of the place, Sarchatta and October 47. And then they say the abductor is somebody called Aslam Khan, Gari Habibullah, Tehsil Mansera, Hazara. They've got all the details of where the, the child or the girl or the woman was last seen. While the two new governments quarrelled over dividing up the arsenals, the treasuries and the artefacts of undivided India, even as they were gearing up for war in Kashmir, India and Pakistan cooperated closely in tracking down women of one community abducted by the other. The operation continued for almost a decade. Sheila Sengupta in Delhi spent much of her time trying to track down kidnapped Muslim women so they could be sent to Pakistan. In summers, the group of volunteers used to go, ladies used to go to some area. We were come to know that this area, there some Muslim girls are there. So some ladies will go and sit there and say that, uh, I want to drink water. Okay, come, we we'll drink water. Uh, are you all happy? Yes, we are happy. I said, what about you? I said, what? You know, my husband has uh, uh, kidnapped, uh, uh, abducted a Muslim woman staying with us. Then this uh, the other lady of that area will say, oh, you know, in that house some Muslim girls, in that house some Muslim girls. This is how we used to get the information. So, summer times, the informations were collected. Winter times, to recover them. Because in winter, in uh, northern India, it's very severe cold. So, they like to be indoors at night. So, the recovery unit used to go with women and uh, men to recover these girls. Some had been used as household skivvies. Others had gone through a nominal conversion ceremony and been married off. Rajeshwari Jolly, a Hindu living close to what became the border, remembers a neighbouring family who found their son a bride by abducting her. People <laughs> People started moving the out, say, the Muslims like packed up and went away. But as these like families were heading for the border, some of their girls were kidnapped. There was a Sikh family we knew. Their son married one of these girls. I was just a little girl myself then and went along with some other women from my family to pay respects to the couple. This girl, she couldn't have been more than 10 or 11. They had given her a Sikh name. Harban's call or something like that? The poor thing was just sitting there not saying a word. She stayed in that house for a while. Then officials in Pakistan got to know about her and they came and took her away. In both halves of Punjab, determined efforts were made to restore women to their families. Brigadier Dillon, a Sikh, moved from Lahore to the Indian side of the partition line. He became an assistant police superintendent and was involved in finding and returning abducted Muslim women. People from the other side came, that is from Pakistan, and they were wanting to rescue these abducted women. And it was this side that I was involved in it. And we, sort of whatever information they had, we took them out and whatever women were living in the villages, we handed them over. They were local women and they are sort of while uh, they were going away or their people were going away, Muslim people, they were abducted by the local people. Not many, but there were some. We would go to the village and we'll say, where is Dina Nath or so-and-so. We said, call her. She was called and I had a magistrate with me also to record the various things if necessary. And she would come and give an evidence that, no, no, I just, um, I was wanting to go with the caravan. The caravan left at night and in the cover of darkness, I couldn't find my, my way about the place. And then this fellow picked me up and he brought me home and here I'm living. No, he is very respectful to me. He hasn't done anything to me. He hasn't said anything to me. He hasn't beaten me up or anything of that sort. So he said, all right, then these people have come. And uh, would you like to go with them? And we have a camp at Amritsar where you would be taken. From there, the whole convoy will go back. So like that, I sent about six or seven women. 
Some Indians were sent into Pakistan to help with the rescue operation. Karaiti Lal, a Punjabi speaker, decided he'd be able to locate more abducted women by going incognito. He adopted a new identity, calling himself Akta Hussain. There were trucks going round from village to village. If there were people stranded, we'd pick them up. The others working with me couldn't speak the local language. I started using a Muslim name and working secretly. What would happen was that the truck had to go to the local police station first and they'd send a Pakistani policeman with us to the village. But often the police would get a message out before we arrived saying if you have a Hindu or a Sikh woman, hide her quickly. Let me tell you about one particular incident. In one of the villages, there was a dugout hole in the ground for keeping pigeons. The opening was blocked by a water pitcher. There was a Muslim man sitting there and he told me, don't touch that pitcher, my pigeons will escape. But I did. And in that hole, there were three young girls. Alongside were containers, mud containers for pigeon feed. This Muslim threatened me with a pistol, but I took no notice. And in among the containers, I found three more girls. That's six women we rescued from there. I.K. Gujral, the man who became India's Prime Minister just months before the nation's Golden Jubilee, himself has memories of these rescue missions. He is a Punjabi, born and brought up in what became Pakistan. His father was given the awesome task of assisting the safe evacuation of millions of non-Muslims, and that included retrieving abducted women. All those women who came back, they had pathetic stories. One of them particularly was the one whose family we personally knew. She was abducted, and by the time we traced her, and we, not we, I mean, I don't know myself, my father, and uh, this lady had been abducted, she had been married off to somebody and she had produced one more child. So when uh, my father contacted her, she started crying like hell and she said, now don't pull me again. I once suffered. I've come here. And now I'll go back. She had two sons on this side also. She didn't know which world to choose. She had one child there, two children here. She didn't know what to choose. It was an absolute pathetic story. That woman stayed in Pakistan. In a sense, she was lucky. She was breaking the rules. Many others in the same position, women who'd been abducted but had found a measure of happiness in their new homes, were not given a choice. If you'd been abducted and were traced, you had to go back. Though in some cases, it meant being sent to a country you'd never seen. Brigadier Dillon on the Indian side had to tell women, apparently anxious to stay with their abductor, that their wishes would have no consequence. Our government was very strict. If the woman gives an evidence, if she doesn't want to complain about it and all that, and she says that I stayed on willingly, even then she cannot stay there. She should be forced out. They knew that uh, even if they resist, uh, they would be sent back. The, the women had no choice. They had to go. This policy of returning women, whatever their own preference, was itself devised by a woman. Mridullah Sarabai, an Indian pioneer of relief work for kidnapped victims. Sheila Sengupta, who worked with her, became increasingly uneasy. She was a very brave lady, but after five years, six years, when she used to insist that these Muslim girls must go back, and sometimes I used to tell her that, why are you pressurizing? Once she lost everything, now she's settled down having children and husband and this and that. She's settled. She doesn't want to go. Why must she? That is the forest policy. That's not you. That's not your thing to decide. But I felt as a young girl, I felt that it is really injustice to a woman. She has just come out from one trauma, settling down in life with a new family, with husband and children. But sometimes we have forced them to go back. What made the problem worse was that while Muslim communities would generally accept women back whatever had befallen them, many Hindus and Sikhs would not. Some women retrieved from Pakistan, forcibly taken away from their new families, were rejected by their old families. A nightmare almost too awful to imagine. 
Korshid Mehta, helping to care for rape victims in Delhi, remembers with anguish those women who were spurned by their own husbands. A stage came when men came to ask for their women. This is, this was, uh, this is my wife. And the moment uh, he knew that she was pregnant, no, I won't take her back. And you could see when an educated man came, he would not take his women back. Very few did. They said, no, we don't want them back. And mind you, a villager would come and ask and say, well, it's not her fault. Never mind, I'll accept her. And they took them. So it was the villagers who took ladies who were pregnant, caring. Yet they took them. But educated men did not. It's not Punjabi women alone who suffered at partition. Across India, rape became a weapon in the communal riots which erupted though nowhere was it as prevalent as in Punjab. All Urvashi Bhutalia can offer in extenuation is the observation that in many bitter internecine conflicts around the world, particularly between rival communities who've long been living side by side, women have paid an appallingly heavy price. You know, I think it's really difficult to come to terms with something like that. And I don't actually think it's particular to Punjabis. And I'm not saying that out of a sense of chauvinism, but it's exactly the same thing that happened in Bosnia. Exactly the same thing happened in the Bangladesh war. The easiest targets are women. And it is used really in a, in a way that is supposedly meant to dilute the purity of whatever race it is. And you see this whole ethnic purity business coming up again and again in different parts of the world. <laughs> That programme was compiled and presented by Andrew Whitehead and produced by Zena Rohan. Next week, comers and goers.